right. So. Wow, look at this guy. Hey, hey, dude, that's cool. That's a cool get up. Who are you? Well, um, my name's Casey. I come from Portland, Oregon, and I'm, uh, I'm doing a cycling trip. Oh, yeah. I'm, a I'm actually at the tail end of it. Uh, I, just I love got, this I just, rig. Yeah, you know, it gets me from point A to point B. This bicycle was bought used for $50 Jeez. Uh, on Craigslist. And uh, this is still the original ring. It has about 80,000 kilometers on wow. it. Wow, wow. And I, I doubled it once, and uh, actually none of the spokes broke, and we just bent it back, and it's still going. Fourth set of tires, though. Jeez. Uh, brand new panniers I just bought. That my old ones finally crapped out and didn't work anymore. But they had patches all over them. That's and, beautiful, uh, and no shock. And no shock. That's right. I take so, it all on my arms. Wow. <laughs> and my back. Is your is your arms are your arms okay? Oh, you just said this is it towards the end of your trip. How's this it? This is the end. I've I've been on the road since September 6, 2007, where I started from Portland, Oregon. And I actually walked, the first idea was to walk to Tierra del Fuego, and I walked the first month and a half. Wow. And actually I didn't start riding the bike until Arcata, California, where my sister lives incidentally. Her uh -huh. name's Amanda. Uh -huh. And uh, anyway, so I've been riding from there. I, I followed the Pacific Coast all the way down through Tijuana, all the way down through Baja, California. Did take a ferry to Mazatlan, Mexico, and then followed the Pacific coast pretty much all the way down, went up into Chiapas, into the mountains for a little while, crossed into Guatemala that way. But for the most part, I've been following the west coast, I've been following the, as you said, the spine, whether it be the mountains uh, in Central America or also the Andes. And uh, I basically followed the Andes all the way from Colombia all the way down to Tierra del Fuego where they peter out and where the oceans meet. And I got down there, and uh, I got down to a little river called Rio Moat, and that's sort of the southernmost uh, river of of the island. And uh, there was a prefecture there, and a guy in his underwear, he came out, there's a barking dog who didn't like me very much, and I, I, we talked for about five minutes, he went back inside because he was cold, and I sat there for about an hour trying to figure out uh, what it all meant. And uh, got on my bike and started riding back home, <laughs> basically. Wow. So, and then yeah, from there I followed the Atlantic coast through through kind of hellish winds. Gets up to about 140 kilometers per hour in in that part of uh, Patagonia and that part of Tierra del Fuego, and then on up along the Atlantic. And now yeah, I've been riding up ever since. I just crossed the border a little over a month ago in Mexico. And yeah, I was gonna say a few words about why I'm doing this. Yeah, why are you doing this? Casey? Casey, that's Casey. right. Uh, Casey well, what? Casey Wilson. Casey, Casey Wilson. Kellogg Wilson. Yeah, why the... The original idea was to show that it's possible to travel in a more sustainable way in terms of energy, but also in terms of time and velocity, and to slow down. To slow down uh, the form of transportation so that maybe... I could see more, I could absorb more, I could uh, somehow get more out of the trip and also talk to people, see people more and just experience everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, the boring, the exciting, everything and just take it all in and and I think it gave me a different perspective on time and, and, on, and distance and it made the world seem more finite and I understand now more than that, seeing the globe from outer space I understand that the world is not that big and the, the resources we have are very finite and we're uh, consuming them at unbelievably fast rates and actually surprisingly one thing that most people don't know that I just want to end with is that the middle class they tend to be the environmentalists the lower middle class, the middle class, the upper middle class they tend to be liberal they tend to be very pro-environment they tend to be interested in sustainability. And one thing that most people don't know is that the middle class, which is roughly about a billion people, they consume the most resources in the world. They consume more than the rich, and they consume more than the poor. Not combined, but more than any of the one group. And so I think that we have a responsibility to start changing our habits. One way is through 
permaculture, which is just, uh, it's a holistic science and strategy. It's a design science for adapting to a climate and a world of energy descent. Each generation will have less and less energy to work with, and we need to figure out incrementally how we're going to deal with that and, and leave a model. These, these wild systems are modeled for, uh, for us to understand what it means to be human and what it means to live in a natural environment. And I, yeah, I mean, I think that everything was wrapped up in this trip. Obviously, it's symbolic. And now the real work starts when I get back home to Portland, Oregon. Uh, what do you mean? The real work starts. The real work starts. I mean, this was my last hurrah. <laughs> I mean, I say that now. We'll see. But uh, anyway, yeah, that's what it was all about. And now I'm heading up into the northernmost part of Canada. It probably freeze my ass off and then going back south to Portland, Oregon. But I'm going to ride up the Continental Divide. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'm going to, to Ned now. Everybody tells me there's cool people there. So we'll see if uh, see if uh, I can meet anybody. We can have some um, good dialogue about, uh, about life. Because I get lonely out there on the road. <laughs> yeah. So nobody paired up with you. You didn't ride. I started with my best friend. And he made it with me at first walking and then cycling and a guy named Colin and my best friend's name is Scott Aronson, a guy named Colin met up with a Canadian, real righteous guy. He rode with us for a while. A guy we called Moose, Musan, which is a Korean American. They called him Chino in Mexico. He didn't like that very much. Uh, he rode with us for a while, but nobody that I started out with riding made it past Panama. And uh, there I planned on riding alone, but going through the, the, the Darien Gap, right, uh, taking a sailboat on my way south. I met uh, two Belgian and two Dutch guys. We spent seven days on an eight meter sailboat called Sacanage, which means dirty sexual habit oh. in Portuguese. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and uh, you can imagine we had five of these bikes full of panniers lashed to the mast, covered with tarps. Uh, bad weather, we were all, almost all of us except for Philip were terribly seasick. Free beer and free uh, hard liquor. None of us wanted to drink. <laughs> oh, it was probably part of the captain's uh, Frederico, his plan. Uh, anyway, yeah, we started riding together, but none of us made it to Tierra del Fuego, the southernmost tip of the world, together. We all made it separately, and only four of us actually made it by bike. One of a, one of the guys named Rafael, he took a bus uh, from Chile, but but we all made it. And I'm the only one who decided to be crazy enough to ride back. Probably because I had about 10 years on them. They were all in their 40s. <laughs> wow. And I couldn't imagine. I felt self-defeating to to take a plane or a bus home after all that. I just couldn't I couldn't imagine it. And so I decided to ride back, and here I am. And, and it feels good. It feels good? It feels good. My knees hurt. And that, I learned I learned uh, how to say that in uh, in Dutch. It's ik heb knie pijn, which means I have knee pain. That was the only thing I learned. Ik <laughs> heb Ikap, ikap, kinipa. I probably am probably kinipa. butchering the the pronunciation, but well, but yeah. Anyway. So, so when uh, so vacation. I mean, it it was kind of about it was kind of about seeing the world. It was learning, about, and that's, and that's why a lot of people take vacations. What do you say to people who don't have time to take it this much time? What kind of vacation should a person take? That how should they take a vacation that would be better for the planet? Then. Well, I mean. It's hard from my perspective to say, I just have to say this, I say, if you're going to be taking a vacation, take a local vacation. And, and because really the, 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 the use of, of fossil fuels for short-term vacations, unless they're sort of multi-use, unless you're, you know, getting involved with the community in a way that will enhance your understanding and connections in the future. And, Unless it's for a reason like that. I mean, I just think these consumptive vacations to get away from what the life we're leading here is a strange concept. And I think we need to get away from that and, and start thinking of vacations as just... There's 15 seconds left on It's just phone. another way to, to learn more and to understand more so that we can go on and, 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 and better our lives. Because our lives are pretty good here, but they're not so good in, in the majority of the world. Thank you.